Uh, as mentioned, I have the honor to present our institution, which is located in Parma. And my presentation will be first explaining what is risk assessment about, the basic principles, and then walk you through uh, uh, with videotapes um, through the whole range of activities that we are currently performing. Why was EFSA erected back in 2002? There were food crises uh, that, uh, that really de determined the need for an independent scientific body to give advice to risk, uh, risk managers. So um, our task was uh, also, I mean, the establishment of our institution was also part of a wider project within the European Union to make a separation between risk assessments and uh, the management of such risks. EFSA therefore is uh, expected to deliver as a scientific risk assessor impartial scientific advice related to food issues. This advice is then further used by the European Commission, the Member States and the European Parliament. Together they are the risk managers and they should decide or enact um, the, the legislation about food safety. The following slide will explain in, in general terms what we understand with risk assessment. Uh, may I just ask uh, with a show of hands, how many of you do have a clear understanding and about what does it entail to assess a risk? Yeah, so I'm happy then that uh, not everybody is an expert and then I can give a little explanation here. So risk assessment, it is a specialized field of applied science. It's, we do not consider it a science on its own. And it inv involves reviewing scientific data and studies that are already existing to evaluate risks associated to certain hazards. So clearly there's a distinction between risk and hazard. The risk assessment process has four main steps. First, we try to identify which are the hazards. Second, we characterize them. We then proceed with an exposure assessment. How much will the potential uh, receiver of harm will be exposed to it? And then together, the data from the hazard assessment and the exposure assessment, we put in an equation that leads us to some kind of a risk uh, characterization. In more detail, hazard identification is the identification of the biological, chemical, or physical agent that may cause adverse health effects and which may be present in a particular food or group of foods. The hazard characterization is then the evaluation of the nature of the adverse health effects associated with the biological, chemical, or physical agents that may be present in food. I hope that this distinction becomes more clear as we go on. Then the next step is the exposure assessment, which is the evaluation of the likely intake of these agents via food. And as said, the risk characterization is then the evaluation of the probability of occurrence and the severity of the potential adverse health effects in a given population. So we try to limit um, the, 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 the group we are focusing on and it is even possible to focus on particularly vulnerable population groups. Now with the following trailer, I would like to show you how EFSA applies these uh, scientific formula in practice. The trailer is produced to um, inform the consumers of the wide range of activities and to give them with vi visual uh, movies a better insight on what we do and how our work impacts on their daily life. Millions of Europeans make choices about food every day. The European Food Safety Authority, or EFSA, helps protect consumers from food-related risks by providing independent scientific advice to the decision makers who regulate food safety. Europe's food comes from an ever-increasing number of sources, so care must be taken to ensure its safety. The following information, importantly to give, is the, the type of, of products we are dealing with, and the list here comprises plant protection, we deal with pesticides, animal health and welfare issues. 
Then there is also the impact on the environment that requires a lot of attention. Transportation and storage of food is another category to look at. Then there is food production and innovation. We think here about the many health claims that we have to assess. And then last but not least, we also investigate the amount of food consumption. The following video tells you more about pesticides. Pesticides are used to protect food crops from pests and disease, but using them safely requires regulation and control. EPSA's scientific experts review and monitor data from member states, industry and academic studies on pesticide residues in food, and assess the risks from pesticides for consumers, farm workers, animals and the environment. EPSA's recommendations have underpinned the setting of science-based safety standards for pesticide residue levels in food. Its work has contributed to removing hundreds of substances used in pesticides from the market. As we move down to the story from field to fork, a very important and sensitive area of our work is the animal health and welfare issues. So here, uh, clearly, we try to reduce and prevent the, the risk of diseases um, that are linked, for instance, uh, to the, with the animal feed. Across Europe, efforts are being made to reduce the levels of foodborne diseases transmitted from animals to humans. For example, salmonella bacteria that cause hundreds of thousands of cases of food poisoning in Europe every year. Member states collect data on the presence of the bacteria in food and animals. EFSA's scientific experts use this data to provide advice to decision makers on the dangers posed to human health by salmonella. EFSA also makes recommendations on how to prevent and reduce these risks. This expertise contributes to an EU-wide salmonella reduction program led by the European Commission that has cut the number of human salmonella cases by half in five years. In this session, we will particularly focus further uh, down on the environmental impact assessment. And um, I can already tell you that we, we go a bit faster now because we want to learn in particular about bee health. So I will then move immediately to the, the, the transportation and storage part of the story, where clearly food during storage and transportation may be exposed to biological infection and chemical contamination. For example, there may be chemical residues from previous cargoes found in the, the containers used to transport edible oils and fats. So EFSA assesses the risks of such contamination from contact with, for instance, animals, food handlers, machinery, vehicles, and packaging material. I think this is a very important part of our work. And one of the last movies will show you a bit how we deal with innovation in EFSA. Uh, one, um, how you say it, a symptom of innovation is on our food packaging. We see often uh, the advances of science re reflecting what the consumption of a given food would, would, uh, would um, give us as a benefit. And uh, that's what we call health claims. And um, in this movie, uh, a bit more explanation is given of what it really means for the consumer. To proceed the story, 
we also invest a lot of our resources to compile what we call food consumption data. I mean, I, I, I explained to you that we need a part of exposure assessment and there, within that exposure assessment, we want to calculate how much intake we have of a certain substance that we are assessing. Now, compiling such consumption data is particularly tricky because everybody has different diet habits. It, it depends from country to country, from age group to age group. It's a, it's a complicated area where we, where we definitely need a multidisciplinary approach and thinking. A lot of statistics help us, epidemiologists, also psychologists. If you, if you issue a questionnaire that questions people how much did you eat from this or that, you, you may easily end up in underestimations and so forth. So it's, it's also an interesting area uh, for EFSA. Now, finally, um, uh, we have a video on how we communicate um, our, our work, which is actually, apart from the scientific pillar, another very important task for EFSA. If there is risk found, it is our task to reach the consumer and to give the right, the right messages. And we have a full directorate dedicated and working hard on this subject. We have had other talks here in, at uh, ESOF uh, demonstrating that it's not, uh, not that easy job to do. The way we produce and consume food is constantly changing as a result of factors such as advances in food technology, climate change, new eating habits, and the globalization of trade. In this ever-changing environment, EFSA's work helps to ensure that our food is safe. So with this, I turn back to my PowerPoint presentation and I have two more additional slides before I give the floor to uh, Fabio, who will talk to you about bee health. So um, I thought that you might be interested that uh, the work that we do for EFSA is uh, the result of a very large uh, network of cooperation with multiple parts and segments of the society and that in that through these channels there is also multiple possibilities for you to contribute with your knowledge. And I just want to give you a few examples that may be of interest for you. We do work with 450 staffs in our EFSA premises in Parma, of which about 60% are involved with the scientific core activities focusing on the mandates of food-related science questions. We have, in addition, the possibility to host seconded national experts that are, that are trained and, and employed in the member states and that for a brief period in their career, they can actually join us in, in our work in EFSA, in Parma. And then for people uh, leaving university at an earlier step of their career, they can apply for a traineeship in EFSA. A second very important uh, part of our operation is to tap into expert knowledge that, uh, from people that are employed elsewhere, outside EFSA. Throughout the European Union, we have a lot of academic research institution or member states risk assessment bodies that uh, have the, the relevant expertise that we need to, to be able to use uh, when developing our scientific opinions. And the, the development of scientific opinions lies in the hand of 10 panels that together span that whole area from, uh, far, from field to fork. And the panel members have a three year of appointment after a call for application. Currently there is one online for which applications can be submitted until the 7th of July. Should you be in the position of having relevant expertise for one of the 10 panels and with your current employer, you, you, you could find an agreement to dedicate some of your time for working for EFSA. This may be a great opportunity. And in addition to the fixed panel members, we also had the possibility to invite people as ad hoc experts. And those expertises will be uh, the, uh, selected from what we call our expert database. You are also free to subscribe such, for such database. Network networks uh, are erected on very topical, uh, topical and specific um, subjects where the member states showed a great deal of interest for. 
and the networks typically comprise of delegates of the 28 member states and we meet yearly with these people. Also, the, uh, the EFSA advisory forum exists that have uh, launched the initiative to appoint for subtopics within the member states' countries focal points. These are people that are additional ears and eyes to pass on communication in both directions, from EFSA towards national institutions and also um, in the opposite direction. If a particular national research institution have relevant data for us, the focal points would transmit that. That is very valuable. Something more general for EFSA and you, you can also as researcher respond to calls of data. Calls for data are important when there is no third party for us to, to demand data sets from. Um, when there is no applicant, to give you one example, when we, when we face um, um, the, the renewal, for instance, for certain food additives, we are expected to, to make ourselves an overview of the most relevant and recent research data. And that, that causes us to launch a public call for data on a, via our um, website. Second, we have a 10 million budget available to issue um, t calls for tender. That is when we require outside people to deliver us specific uh, project results, outputs. So this is also something that can be important to monitor. Don't forget there are also online public consultations on draft documents where we invite the broad scientific community, community to provide uh, comments to us or to maybe correct, refine or co complement whatever is already in that draft document. You can also participate to scientific colloquia and you are always welcome in EFSA to attend our open plenaries. With this, thank you for your attention and uh, I can take now any specific burning questions on these slides. Thank you. Okay, good afternoon everybody. Uh, I want to thank EFSA for the invitation. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here in this beautiful room. Um, I am a bee specialist. I study bees. And today I'm going to talk about the bee decline, the problem of bee decline. So if honeybees become extinct, human society will follow in four years. Put your hand up if uh, you have already heard this statement. <laughs> Did you hear this? Okay. This was uh, attributed to Albert Einstein, but I'm sorry, uh, I have uh, to declare that uh, Einstein uh, has never said this uh, quote. <laughs> it's true, yeah. yeah. Although this is uh, often repeated, but uh, there is no document that shows that Albert Einstein has said this. So it's just, I don't know why. But. Anyway, I think we can learn something from this uh, quote. Uh, and uh, it should be interpreted in this way. No more bees, no more food, no more men. So, and uh, if we remove the word honey, thus including all species of bees, the consequence of this prediction could be much bigger. In fact, apart from the domesticated uh, honeybees, Apis mellifera, in the world uh, there are at least other 60,000 species of bees. And most of them are important uh, pollinators. So everybody knows um, the social bee honeybees, Apis mellifera. Somebody knows another social bee, the bumblebees, Bombus terrestris. But, but very few people know that in the world exist many other species of bees, and most of them are solitary. That is, each female builds and provisions her nest without the, the assistance from other uh, bees. And uh, um, all these species of bees show uh, differences in behavior, in life cycle, in physiology. Most of uh, these species nest underground, like the alkali bee, Nomia melanderi. Other bees nest in pre-established cavities, like a burrow in the dead wood. Uno of these species of bees. Here, please. Nobody. Okay. This is uh, the leaf-cutting bees, Megachile rotundata. Uh, they collect pieces of leaves to build their nest. So you can see in this picture. 
And this is uh, the inside nest of Osmia bicornis. We call it also meson bees because they collect pieces of mud to build a mud partition between each uh, pedotrophic cell. These pieces uh, sometimes nest in uh, empty shells like this. So maybe at the end of this meeting, uh, when you go out, uh, you uh, observe the flower, maybe you can uh, see many other species of bees that you, you don't know. But may, today, no, but <laughs> in a sunny day, it's possible <laughs> to see many different uh, kinds of bees. However, unfortunately, in the last, um, oh, I forgot to say that all these species of bees are extremely important uh, for us. In fact, uh, without bees, forget about eating uh, peaches, uh, apples, uh, um, strawberries, lemon, uh, many types of fruit and some uh, vegetable. So uh, bees are responsible for one out of every three bites of food we eat. Here, our supermarket looks with uh, bees and this without bees, so we see the difference. So, but bees is uh, important not only for food. Bees is extremely important for, uh, to maintain biodiversity. Up to 94% of wild flowering plants depend on animal pollination. And somebody said that the biodiversity is the immune system of the plant. For all this reason, we have to protect bees. However, unfortunately, like you know, um, in the last years, um, there is evidence in uh, Europe and North America that uh, bees are in decline both in abundance and uh, distribution. Uh, in the past, you have to know that the average colony mortality rate for honeybees was around 10, 15%. So we consider this the normal mortality rate. But in the last uh, few years, in the last seven years, the mortality rate has risen up to 35%, reaching 90% in some area of the uh, United States. And this is a lot, it's a big problem for beekeeping. And uh, most of the colony losses, uh, in, uh, in particular in North America, uh, were attributed to a new uh, strange phenomenon called the Colony Collapse Disorder, or CCD. Uh, a CCD-affected colony is uh, usually characterized by an empty hive with no or very few adult bees inside. So the bees are uh, just disappearing, flying away without no sign of uh, disease or the presence of uh, dead bees in, in the eye or in front of the eye. For, for this reason, we have this funny representation. It's a cartoon where uh, there is a bee that talk with barman and say, go home, why should I go home? My beekeeper doesn't understand me. It's just a funny representation of the mystery of uh, bee losses. So this is the data of the United States. We can see in the last seven years, the percentage of colony losses. As I told you before, we consider the normal mortality 10, 15 percent. But here we can see that the mortality rate is around 30, 35 percent. And this is um, a hive, a colony affected by CCD. We can see there is the brood. So the, the capped brood is uh, in good condition in this case. But there are very few adult bees. And this is an healthy colony. You can see the difference because there are many adult bees in this healthy colony. Similar situation in Europe. This is the percentage of colony losses in different countries in Europe. You can see that in several cases the mortality rate is higher than 10-15%. Similar results in 2012-2013. Unfortunately, in Europe, uh, the information is scarce. It's not so detailed like in the uh, United States. We have a continuous record of uh, colony losses only for very few countries. And similar situation for wild bees. For wild bees, we don't have a, a large monitoring program. So we don't know exactly the situation for wild bees. But we have some information. We, all, we know that also wild bees are mm, in decline, at least in UK, in Netherlands, in Italy, and uh, in Illinois. So um, since uh, 2006, when um, for the first time the CCD symptoms uh, were described, many people tried uh, to figure out uh, the um, consequences, the, the, the causes of uh, this um, phenomenon. And, uh, and many factors have been taken uh, into account to explain uh, CCD. 
some quite uh, creative, like uh, UFO, or the face of moon, or the price of gas, or the rap music. Other more possible, like the electromagnetic radiation, and other almost uh, certainly involved, like uh, pesticides and some um, pathogens. However, most research has focused uh, on the individual impacts and has overlooked the, the complex nature of the problem, thereby only passionately explaining the causes and the consequences of pollination decline. Uh, we know that sometimes the uh, colony losses can be uh, attributed to by a single factor, like, for example, varroa destructor. Varroa mite is a big problem for the beekeeping. Um, beekeepers call it uh, vampire mite because uh, it feeds on the body fluid of bees, making the single bees more sensitive to other stressors, like uh, virus or pesticides. So they affect the immune system of bees, they reduce the longevity, or they uh, produce malformation, affect the brood, and uh, is a vector of many uh, viruses. At, at the moment, there is no a good control, um, a good method to control varroa, and so this is a problem for beekeepers. So, in fact, how we can how can we uh, kill a bug on a bug without harming both? Another problem is uh, pesticides. We know that uh, sometimes uh, pesticides can affect bees, and we observe the effect when there are uh, many uh, dead bees in front of the eye. In this case, um, bees are exposed to high concentration of pesticides, but bees can be exposed also to uh, low concentration. In this case, pesticides can affect uh, bees in subliteral uh, level, affecting, for example, the learning ability, the orientation, the thermoregulation capacity, and the brood care, etc. Bees can be exposed to pesticides in several ways. For example, eating contaminated nectar and pollen, or honeydews and, and water. And pesticides can affect uh, both adults and brood. Among the different groups of pesticides, neonicotinoids, uh, neonicotinoids or neonics, um, have emerged as a public enemy number one in the eyes of the anti-pesticide activists, but not only. Uh, since uh, their introduction in uh, the 90s, their use has reached 30% by value of the global insecticide market. In this graph, we can see the trend in agricultural use of neonicotinoids in Britain. And uh, in Britain, there are uh, um, at least five different compounds in the group of neonicotinoids. Um, this includes uh, tiametoxam, tiaclopid, clotianidid, acetamiprid, and imidacloprid. Probably you know some of these compounds. And um, neonicotinoids are uh, systemic pesticides. I mean that uh, they are absorbed by plants via roots and, uh, or leaves, and they are transported uh, in all plant tissue, so they can reach all the um, part of the plant. Uh, and this uh, is uh, from the grower point of view is good because uh, it can protect all the plant tissue. But on the other hand, they can reach the pollen and the nectar that are collected by bees. Bees can be exposed to pesticides also in other ways. For example, when bees collect plant exudates, like cutation and drops, or uh, uh, are exposed to contaminated death, dust spread uh, from machine during sowing operation or when bees contact uh, contaminated water or soil. In the soil, this compound can persist for many uh, months, even years. However, uh, bees, um, okay, pesticides can kill bees when they are exposed to high concentration, but they can affect bees also when uh, uh, bees are exposed to sublethal doses. For this reason, we consider um, pesticides a cofactor in a multi-factorial um, process of bee decline. So here I try to imagine uh, my life if uh, I was uh, stressed, up, stressed out by multiple factors. So this is me. So now imagine to have a big blood sucking parasite attached to your back. Then to having a virus like flu every day. And to drink alcoholic cocktail 
OK, this could, may not be a stressor for somebody, but I put also this. And to eat the same day, uh, the, every day, the same food. So let me put all this together for you. How would you feel? Taken singularly, these factors are not so dangerous, but all together, yes. So now go back to bees. Bees are affected by varroa mites. Varroa is ubiquitous, it's everywhere. Um, in the hive, there are many pathogens, many viruses. Uh, data from the Italian monitoring network showed that uh, more than 90% of the colony uh, is affected by the virus uh, DWV. From 40 to 80% of the colonies are affected by Nosema serana. Nosema serana is a microsporidium. A recent uh, report of Greenpeace showed that uh, over two thirds of the pollen collected by bees is contaminated by cocktail of up to 70 uh, different pesticides. Moreover, bees live often in what we call a food desert. So the hive is surrounded by monocrops and often the monocrops like maize, for example, produce pollen of low nutritional quality. So bees like human need to eat uh, a varied diet to get all the essential, essential amino acids. For this reason, monocrop is a problem for, for bees. So, mm, bee mortality and colony losses are complex phenomena, and often it's not easy to find the link between the causes and the effects. This is, is even more complicated in the honeybees, in the Apis mellifera, because uh, uh, Apis mellifera is uh, a superorganism. So we consider the colony the organism, that it's comprised by many thousands of uh, single bees. So in the colony, probably you know there is uh, one queen, um, several hundreds of drones, the male, only in, uh, in spring and summer, and many thousands of uh, workers. So there is no a central authority. The queen is only entrusted to lay eggs. So, mm, but in the, in the hive, the organization of the work is amazing, it's fantastic. So every single bee knows exactly what they have to do. And uh, we, uh, they do this with, uh, we call it the social behavior, or with the social, uh, socio-physiological mechanism. Socio-physiological mechanism are some uh, mechanisms that uh, uh, are able to maintain the equilibrium of the colony. And my uh, personal favorite, the one that I have studied in my research group, is the thermoregulation system of the colony. Bees, adult bees, are able to maintain the central area, the, cent the central brood area, at constant temperature, around 34-35%. This is fantastic because it's like human. We are able to maintain constant our body temperature. Bees are able to do the same. So we put uh, um, some digital thermometers in the center of the hive where there is the brood. And we measure the temperature. We can see that the results. So the temperature during spring summer in presence of brood is the temperature is constant. But what's happen if we reduce the temperature in the brood uh, just only two degrees less? We performed an experiment some years ago. So we read the um, young larvae, one day old, uh, in a standard diet condition in lab. So we put one group of larvae at 35 degrees, the optimal temperature. Another group at 33 degrees, the suboptimal temperature. And we measured uh, several parameters, like uh, the developmental mortality, the emergence rates, uh, the adult longevity, and the adult sensitivity to pesticide. So we found no difference in developmental mortality. No difference in emergence rate. So this means that all bees reach the adult stage. But the adult longevity was affected. The bees reared at uh, optimal temperature live longer than bees reared at suboptimal temperature. And the bees reared at suboptimal temperature are more sensitive to pesticide. In this case, uh, we tested the dimethoate, that is an insecticide. So now, based on these uh, results, we hypothesized the following scenario. Okay, supposed to have a slight bilosis in early spring due to maybe poisoning or disease. 
In early spring, there is a delicate balance between health and brood because uh, the external temperature in, during, the night, in, during the night is very low, and also the number of uh, adult workers is, uh, is low. So it's not, uh, there is very few adult workers after, in the early spring. So maybe the, the bee number is sufficient to assure optimal brood temperature, but not enough to assure brood survival. So this produces that um, the brood is reared at suboptimal temperature. So we have no influence, this produces no influence on larva mortality and adult emergence, but the newly adult bees will live shorter. So this, so again, the number of adult bees could be insufficient to maintain the optimal temperature, or these new adult bees cannot be able to maintain the optimal temperature because the thermoregulation capacity was affected by the reading temperature. So this produces what we call a nasty positive feedback loop. So this again, again, in generation in generation during the years until the colony collapse. So this is just an example to show you how it's difficult to link the cause with the effect because we have, have the causes in the, in the early spring, but we see the final effect only later, maybe in early, uh, in, uh, early winter or in late summer. It's also an example to show you how the effect observed on single bees can, af uh, can affect the whole colony in field. In fact, we can study multiple stressors in bees across levels of biological organization, from subindividual level to individual to colony in case of social bees, to population and species. We can study multiple stressors in lab in a standardized condition but we can study the effect also in a more realistic condition, in field. We can study the effect on colony and population only in semi-field and field study. In this case, monitoring is required to provide the baseline data on exposure of colony or population to stressor. However, up to now, most of the study in bees were performed on single bees in lab. So, um, However, we don't know if the, the effect observed on single bees are also relevant in field. For, uh, in fact, um, the, effect, the effects observed on single bees um, can affect, of, of course, also the colony, but at the colony level, the effect on single bees can be mitigated or exacerbated, so we don't know. For this reason, we need, we need also field study. But field study in bees is a very complicated study are, are um, time-consuming and uh, expensive. This is because uh, bees show a large foraging range, in average 1.5 kilometers, but they can reach also 10 kilometers, depend by the food availability. So they have a large foraging area, 700 hectares. So when we perform field study, we have to consider all the variables in this uh, large area. And so this is a problem when we perform field study. Also, from a statistical point of view, if we want enough repetition, we have to find 700 hectares different in different uh, places. And this is also a problem to, to find a good control, because the control life should be at least four or six uh, kilometers away from the treated colony. For this reason, reason uh, the challenge in bee research is to extrapolate the effects of certain in laboratory conditions at, at individual level to the effects in field at colony level. In this case, can models help? Yes, models can help. There are uh, already some uh, models available in uh, literature. I suggest you to, to read this paper. But they cannot give the final conclusive answer. They are important to determine general trends, but uh, they need reliable data to parameterize models, which require testing or validation in the field. So again, we have to come back in the field. So just in conclusion, my presentation, how, we can, uh, how can we help uh, bees? The answer is not uh, in, in this presentation, in my opinion, in this um, slide, in this slide. Some people are trying to produce robotic pollinators but I don't think the, they can substitute bees. In China, people are performing uh, hand pollination, 
but uh, in the world there, uh, there, is, uh, there are not enough uh, humans to pollinate all our crops by, by hands. So in my opinion, the answers are in this, on these slides. So first of all, we need the collaboration between scientists, environmentalists, farmers, beekeepers, industry and government. We have to promote uh, the IPM strategy in agriculture, the integrated pest management, with a rational use of pesticide. I mean, to use pesticide only when and where they need. To avoid paralysis by analysis, by acting to reduce potential harm when there is uh, um, problem from concern. And to establish national surveillance programs in each European country, both for honeybees and wild bees and to increase the bee-friendly plants biodiversity and keep them free, uh, free from pesticides. This is very important because everybody here can do this. So we can do this in our gardens, in our back hills. So at the end, every people can help bees to survive. So next generations will thank you for this and I thank you for uh, your attention. <laughs>